Deuteronomy chapter 5. We'll read this time from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 to 21. Let's read God's most holy law. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor thy, any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out of thence through a mighty hand and by a stretch out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may, it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, neither thou shalt commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shall thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. This for the reading of God's law. Let's now sing from Psalter 350. Psalter, as we continue our exposition through the book of Hebrews, continuing through the famous hall of faith, as it is found in Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 22. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore it sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having him received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, 
if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have, might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac... Bless Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worship leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. This part of the reading of God's word. Let's now come before the Lord of Zion, fear God's holy hill, wherein our God delights should dwell. Let my right hand forget her skill, yet I, if I forget to love thee well. Our text this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 22, as we'll continue meditating through the book of Hebrews. But before we begin, let's ask once again for the Lord's blessing. Let's pray. O oh, our Heavenly Father, as we, as we open thy word now, Lord, we hope to hear thy truths being spoken for thy, from thy throne, Lord. Lift up our eyes to see the glory of thy kingdom, to have a hope that goes beyond this world, a faith beyond the grave, to live in faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to hold fast and to endure till the end, and to long to be with thee forevermore. Even as we sing, Lord, today, we take this as a confession before Thee that the worst thing could happen to us is to forget Thee and forget Thy kingdom. So use this passage today, Lord, to remember us of Thy glory, to remember us of the promises that go beyond the grave and beyond this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We started an exposition through the book of Hebrews uh, a couple months ago, and then we have been going through this book. And we now have reached the famous Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And the author has been urging us that the way to persevere and endure the Christian walk is to cling to Christ to hold fast, to hold to Christ, that is our only hope. In this section, the author continues to urge us to not drift away and to cling to Christ. And here he develops the theme of faith using those who persevere to the end, walking not by sight, but by faith. Abraham and his heirs lived not out of the things of this world, but waiting the fulfillment of the promises in the world to come. They knew God is the giver of life, the rewarder of those who seek Him, and that even after their death, God would fulfill His promises. Ultimately, not simply here, but in the world to come. All the examples given here in our passage today are going to speak of characters on the verge of death, the edge between the two worlds, 
people who were about to die. They confessed that they were strangers and sojourners waiting for a better country. They did not look with earthly eyes to the realities here, but had their eyes focused on eternity before them. Faith trusts God's promise for the future, even if we can't see it yet, beyond this world and life. Or simply putting it, faith trusts God beyond the grave. These characters teach us how to have this kind of faith, a faith that goes beyond the grave. And to meditate on this, we'll divide our text today into five points. It's a bit different, but text lends well into five points this morning. First, the faithful one endures or the faithful one obeys God's call. Second, Trust God's promises, verses 11 and 12. Third, aspires God's land, verses 13 to 16. Fourth, the faithful one withstands God's test, verses 17 to 19. And fifth, looks to God's exodus, verses 20 to 22. So first of all, let's consider how the faithful one obeys God's call. After Noah, the author moves now to Abraham, and he is the center character through all, all this passage. It's Abraham and his heirs. The text opens with a summary of Abraham's life in verse 8. And the original, original text has a slightly different order than what we have in the English here. The text says, by faith, being called Abraham obeyed, and then it, it explains how he obeyed, to go into a place which he was going to receive for inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Notice the just the position here. By faith being called, he obeyed. That's the summary of his life. Being called, he obeyed. All that happened in Genesis chapter 12 and 13, how Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan, the process of how he went through Egypt, how he departed from Lot, all that narrative, all that story can be summarized with just a few words, four words in Greek. By faith, Abraham being called, obeyed. That's the summary of his life. The first in time in Genesis that we are told that Abraham believed it is in chapter 15, verse 6. It says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. But the author of Hebrews is telling us that way before chapter 15, Abraham had already believed. Way before that, Abraham believed so his obedience was a fruit of his faith, of his believing in the Lord. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, and Galatians 3, verse 6. That Abraham was justified by faith. Obedience flows from faith. We can obey until we believe. That's the message here. That's the right order that the text lays before us. But why was it so important for Abraham to believe in order to obey? Abraham was promised a place that he should receive for inheritance in Genesis 12, verse 1. But children, what did God tell Abraham in that occasion? What did God tell Abraham about that land that they were going to receive? Did God tell Abraham where that land was? Did God tell Abraham how big that land was, where it was? Did God point in the map where the land was or gave, or gave him a GPS to know how to get to that land? Did God show images or send a postcard of that land to show Abraham how that land looked like? No. No. 
God didn't do none of that. God simply said in Genesis 12, verse 1, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Therefore, Hebrews tells us that he went to a place not knowing whether he was going. Can you imagine doing something like that? God telling you, you are going to move to leave everything behind. But you don't know where. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you in the future. But first, you'll leave everything behind. How would you react? God called you to do that. Even without knowing, by faith, he obeyed. Abraham, Abraham trusts so much the promise that how to get there was not important to him. By faith, we should do the same. To trust so much in God's promises that it, the, the details of how things will work out of how things will play out, simply don't matter to us. We know the outcome. We know the promises, and that's what matters to us. And we trust Him, so we obey. We know we will receive the final inheritance like Abraham, so we simply obey. How can our lives be summarized? In some sense, the Christian walk is very simple. Being called, obey. It's very straightforward. It's not complex at all. Faith leads to obedience. The faithful one obeys God's call. If we are not obeying, we ought to question whether or not we are really believing in the things we say we believe. Faith leads to obedience. That doesn't mean it's easy to obey. Abraham got his family, packed everything up, and left. But even when he finally got to the land, to that mysterious land, God didn't give that land to him immediately. He had to leave in tents, verse 9. More surprising, surprising than not knowing where he was going is that when he got there, the land was inhabited. The Lord promised to give Abraham that land, promised to give to him and his inheritance that land. But did the Lord forget to tell the Canaanites? Did the Lord forget to tell the Philistines about that promise? Because the land was inhabited. But even though Abraham could not see the promise realized in his time, he trusted in that promise. Verse 9, by faith... He sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. How could Abraham not get discouraged? He had to sojourn as a stranger without seeing the promises being fulfilled in his time. The Lord told him to leave and when he got there, the land was not his. How could Abraham not get, him, not get discouraged? He didn't get the land in fact, the only piece of land that the patriarch Abraham owned was a grave. In Genesis 23, we read how Abraham lived as a stranger, and even the grave for his wife to die was pricey for him to obtain. Even a place to die was hard for him to get. So how could Abraham endure and trust the promise that he would receive the land even if he didn't see. Even if he didn't have a place to die. How could he obey without wavering? Thankfully, we don't need to wonder. Verse 10 spills out what was in Abraham's mind. What went through the mind of the patriarch. Verse 10 for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Because they looked for a better country, a city that is unshakable, whose builder and maker is God. 
a city that is eternal, a city that is greater than Canaan. Yes, he knew that one day his heirs would inherit Canaan, but he was looking beyond Canaan. He was looking to the heavenly Jerusalem that one day he would inherit. That's where his eyes were fixed. The city of God. Different than the earthly Jerusalem that would one day be destroyed. In fact, Jerusalem, or more specifically the temple in Jerusalem, would be destroyed twice. Imagine how important this message was both in the times of Abraham and in the time of the letter to the Hebrews. First time during exile, after the Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem. And also in 70 AD, when the Romans as well destroyed the temple a second time. So this is why it was so important to them to know that they were looking not to an earthly temple, or to an earthly land, but to a heavenly Jerusalem, to a much more glorious temple, God's presence, God's real presence in the heavenly Zion. Abraham believed that he and his people would eventually receive Canaan. But what really motivated him was that they would receive something better, a better land, a future land, heaven itself. The final goal of the Old Testament was not to inherit, inherit Canaan, but heaven itself, whose builder and maker is God. We have the same promise as Abraham. He was still willing to do, he was willing to do what he did because he had the promise of a heavenly home before him. Well, Jesus told us in John 14, verses 2 and 3, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We have the same promise of a greater greater home, of a better country, a better Jerusalem. Seeing that we have the same promise, are we willing to obey like Abraham? Being called, we obey. To go and to stay where God leads. To live and die as strangers. The more we look to heaven and long for heaven, that will enable us to obey better. Faith leads to obedience. Faith obeys God's call. Or the faithful one obeys God's call. But a fundamental aspect of faith is trusting. And that is our second point. Faith trusts God's promises. Verses 11 and 12. These heroes of faith trusted that God would fulfill his promises. Even beyond the grave. And because of that they obeyed. But trusting is not always easy. Sometimes it challenges our logic. It doesn't make sense. God didn't simply promise Abraham a land to inherit, but also a people to inherit the land. But there was a problem in that as well. Abraham and Sarah were both too old to have children. Sarah was old and barren. The text says that she was already past age, verse 11. But although Sarah was old and barren, she trusted in the promise of the Lord. She considered the one who had promised faithful, says verse 11, because she judged him faithful who had promised. And notice how this chapter speaks a lot about promise. Five times in verse 9, 11, 13, 17. It's all about holding to these promises, trusting the promises. One definition of promise is a declaration to do something with implication of obligation to carry out what is stated 
They knew the promises of God. They held the promises of God. They trust the promises. They loved the promises. And they knew that God was faithful to keep those promises. They knew that because he promised and he was faithful, he would never break his promises. Likewise, in terms of being able to have children by natural means, not only Sarah was old and barren, but also Abraham, verse 12, tells us that he was as good as dead. But because of their faith, therefore, verse 12, the Lord brought a great offspring from him. When you read Genesis 17 to 21, the story of Abraham and Sarah until the birth of Isaac, it appears that the Lord waited until the very last minute to fulfill this promise. In fact, it got to a point that it seemed that it was too late. It was too late. The, war, the Lord waited for too long. The promise seemed impossible to be realized. Sarah was barren and old. Abraham as good as dead. And yet, it is often when we don't expect or when it seems impossible that the Lord brings his promises to fulfillment. It's a way to humble us. To show that it doesn't depend on us, but on the one who gave the promises in the first place. That is not on us, but in his faithfulness to keep until the end. We know the story. We know that Isaac was born, but you might wonder, did Abraham's descendants really become as numerous as the stars of the sky or the sand on the seashore? Can we really say God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled? Well, the great people promised to Abraham was not simply the people of Israel. Just as the land was not simply the land of Canaan. Not just physical Israel, but a true and better Israel. All those who believe in Jesus. That's Paul's argument in Galatians chapter 3, concluding verse 29. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The story of Abraham is not just his story and his descendants. It's our story. Not just of the Israelites, but of a true and better Israel who were brought in, who were engrafted in Christ, united to him, and now became heirs of the same promise. It's how God has promised a nation, how God has promised to redeem a people and brings to himself a people, to him, of those who trust in Christ Jesus. It's my story, your story. Trusting God's promises is a mark that you belong to God's people. This means that Abraham was excited about this promise given to him, not because of a physical Israel, not because one day there would be many and inherit the physical land, no, but because of you and me who would be added to a multitude that cannot be counted, that cannot be numbered, to become heirs of the same promise. Ultimately, that promise was fulfilled in Christ when the Messiah from the line of Abraham came to redeem his people. That is why Jesus can say in John 8, 56, your father Abraham, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. He was glad to see the day that the promise would be fulfilled of the heir who would come from the line of Abraham to finally bring to a fulfillment, to finally join to him many nations and peoples from different tribes and tongues. 
gathered and united to Him, we have the same promise. We must trust in the same promises Abraham held. We are the people God promised to prepare if you believe in Jesus by faith. If you trust in Him as your God and Savior, do you want to inherit the same promises as Abraham? You don't need to become a Jew. You need to believe in Christ and trust the same promises Abraham had of a better land, of a better people that God was preparing for those who believe in Jesus Christ. Abraham's story is our story. If by faith we trust in him, that is the justifier of those who seek him. One of the promises a believer trusts is of a better country, which leads us to aspire for a, the heavenly Jerusalem, to aspire for God's land. Our third point. Abraham lived to see Isaac being born, but he didn't live to see his offspring become as many as the stars of the sky. He died without seeing the promises being fulfilled, or at least being completely fulfilled. Abraham is a great illustration of Hebrews 1 verse 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He believed without seeing it. And he believed until the end, until he died in faith. Faith marked not only how they finished the, their life, but also how they lived. Verse 13 tells us that they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I'm a foreigner. I'm a a stranger on this land. And I confess that sometimes I feel nostalgic. I miss the foods of my country. I miss the people of my country. The tongue, the nature, the language. I miss things from my country. Yeah, Brazil is great, but guess what? Heaven is far greater Heaven is much better than anything that is in this world. Even in Brazil or America, for most of you, or the Netherlands or Israel, a Christian will always be a stranger, a pilgrim on this world. If you have moved to a different country or different states even, or travel abroad at some point. Perhaps you have experienced this. When someone looks at you, you don't need to speak more than two or three words. They look at you and they ask, you're not from around here, are you? We as Christians should carry kind of a thick accent from heaven. We should exuberate a savor of heaven. That whenever we open our mouths, people realize you are not from around here, are you? Look at this man, look at this woman, the way that they speak. It's so different. The savor of life that they carry. I have never experienced something like this. You cannot be from around here. The call to Christianity is not a call to popularity, but to become a stranger, a pilgrim on this world. 68% of Americans identify as Christians. Where are these Christians in society? They are not living as strangers, as pilgrims on this world. Society would be much different if 68% of Americans were living as strangers, 
on this world. They are very much at home. At home with the culture. At home with promiscuity. At home with sin. At home with a materialistic mindset. At home with the things of this world. 68% of Americans identify as Christians. Where are the Abrahams and Sarahs of our times? Where are those who live and die for these promises? Peace with the sins of this world might lead us to forget heaven. The sins of old were so persuaded of the reality of where they were going that even in suffering they were able to embrace the promises. They were not simply seeking a country, but they were seeking a homeland. That's the word for country in verse 14, a homeland. This message applies to the persecuted Christians at the time of the letter to the Hebrews, and it applies to us as well. We wait for the eschatological homeland that is prepared for us, the final destination The final heavenly Jerusalem. If all that they cared about was a piece of ground, Abraham could have returned to Ur of the Chaldeans, or Jacob could have stayed with Laban and not returned to Canaan. That's what verse 15 tells us. But they knew better. They knew there was no way to go anywhere but to the place where God had promised them. There was no way that they would turn back to what God had promised to them. The receivers of the letters to the Hebrews were tempted to return, to go back to Judaism, to Judaism, to abandon the promises of God. You see, it would be easier to be friends with Rome. Judaism was the legal religion at that time. So they would avoid much persecution if they turned back and returned to Judaism. The same for Abraham to return to Ur of the Chaldeans. He would not have to live as a stranger. The same for us. It is easier to be friends with the world, to be friends with Rome, to go with the majority. By the way, it is easier to be a stranger today than it was in the times of Abraham. You condemn same-sex attractions. You condemn abortion. You condemn that there is any other way to salvation but through Jesus Christ. There you go, you are a minority. Probably even within broad evangelicalism, you are already a minority. The question is not, where are the promises of God today? But where are those who live and die for these promises? The same promises we have today. These heroes of faith were willing to be persecuted, mocked, excluded, and even die for these promises. Because they knew there was nothing better than this. Verse 16. But now they desire a better country. That is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. Once again, again we see one of the author's favorite words, better. They desired a better country. Jesus brings a better covenant, 722, and offers a better sacrifice, chapter 923. We have seen this word many times, but now it's used for something else than Jesus. They desire a better country. 
unlike the earthly Jerusalem, God Himself is the builder of the heavenly Jerusalem, whose builder and maker is God. There was so much expectation in the Old Testament about Jerusalem. We even sang a few psalms today about Jerusalem and Zion and the hope of the glory of that land. We also read in Isaiah 24, verse 23, then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Or Jeremiah 3, verse 17. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall be gathered unto it. To the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, Neither shall they, shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. What the author of Hebrews is saying is that all the expectation about a city was not merely regarding a piece of ground, but to dwell in God's presence, to be once again in the presence of the living God, to return to the garden, to return to the presence of God, to enter into the most holy place, to be united with God. That was the hope. The patriarchs longed for this heavenly city. They live in this world, but they never cease to desire a heavenly homeland. Not just a piece of land, but an everlasting destination to be united with Him. They desire heaven so much to the point of God not being ashamed to be called their God. They were identified with God and now God is not ashamed to be identified with them. What would these heroes of faith think? If they knew that many today are ashamed of God. That many today are ashamed to be called Christians. Are ashamed to speak the truths of the Bible. See the irony. So they became ashamed for God. Do not be conformed to this world. Paul says in Romans 1, 22. This is not home yet. Don't try to resemble this world. To look like them, to dress like them, to speak like them. To live like, like them. You are not from around here. The faithful one aspires God's land. We aspire for a better homeland. The reasons why these truths need to be so grounded in our hearts is that we will be put to the test. As we will see in our fourth point. Verse 19 tells us, By faith Abraham, when he was tried or tested. And maybe you are wondering as you read these words, now he is going to be tested? You are telling me, Lord, that all that happened before wasn't enough? And now, and just now, he is going to be put to the test? What about all that happened before? Wasn't that enough? By faith, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that read received the promises offered up his only begotten son. This is a reference to Genesis chapter 22. And I'm sure you remember this story. Abraham and Sarah waited for so long for Isaac to be born. Their only son. And God asked Abraham to go and sacrifice their son in Mount Moriah. Not only 
Abraham loved Isaac, but it was through Isaac that God would give Abraham a great offspring. So apparently, God would be taking back the promise that he gave. Verse 18, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. What is going on? Is God taking back his promise? Asking a parent to sacrifice a son would already be an impossible task. But God was asking for the son of the promise. His only begotten, his unique, his one and only son. The miracle child. God promised Abraham a land. But what would a land be worth without a people? God promised to multiply his offspring and to bless all the nations through him. But that that promise was going to be fulfilled through Isaac and not Ishmael. Was God removing his promises? Can God withdraw one of his promises? Is that possible? The promises of God seem to contradict what God was requiring from him. And yet he trusted God. Even if he could not make sense of what was happening, even if he could not make sense of what God was requiring from him, he trusted God. He knew one thing, that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans eleven twenty nine. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God cannot cancel his promises. It's impossible for God to cancel his promises. What he has promised, he will fulfill. You might be going through a hard trial in your life. And no doubt there are so many tests to our faith during our lives. Trials that make you wonder... If we will really receive the promises God gave us. One promise that we often doubt. Is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. How Lord? How is it possible? How is it possible if I have a cancer? How is it possible if. My child had a car accident and is now debilitated. How is it possible when my house burned to the ground and my wife and children died in that fire? How is it possible that all things work together for good of them that love God? Where is the good in it, Lord? The promise is not that we will not die or avoid suffering somehow, but that not even death shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is the greatest good that that is, that could ever be, that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Abraham was tested to doubt whether God would make him a great nation. The receivers of the letter were were tested to doubt whether it was worth holding fast to Christ. We might be tempted to doubt whether the church will really prevail until the end against the gates of hell. Or tested to see if we are willing to compromise Or tests that you see if we are too comfortable with the things of this world that perhaps we forgot heaven. And maybe this is the greatest task of our days. To remember that this is not home yet. What would you do in Abraham's shoes? Abraham got ready the next morning. And went with Isaac to Mount Moriah. 
he had no doubt God's promise would be kept. It wasn't an option for him that God would break his promises to the point of being ready to sacrifice his only son. What was Abraham thinking during that time? We don't have to wonder again. The text tells us, verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham had faith that God would never break his promises. In fact, God is so faithful that he would even raise Isaac back from the dead if needed. Abraham trusted that not even death could end God's promises. That is why we read in Genesis 22 verse 5 when Abraham says, as he's going to Mount Moriah, I and the boy will go over there and worship and we will come again to you. We will return. He trusted that somehow he would return with Isaac. He would come again. That somehow God would still fulfill his promises, even through death. And verse 19 tells us that, figuratively speaking, God did raise him up from the dead by providing another sacrifice. The ram was sacrificed so that Isaac would go free. This is, of course, a picture of what Christ would do. God spared Abraham's son by providing a ram to be sacrificed. But one day, God would give his only begotten son and on that day, no voice would come from heaven to stop the sacrifice from happening. There would be no substitute for Jesus on that day. Because he is our substitute. Even being sacrificed, even dying, he would obtain the victory over death. Being raised from the dead. The story of Isaac is a picture lesson of what the one who is greater than Isaac would do one day. The father would hand over his son, his only begotten son, the son of the promise, would go to be sacrificed, not in ignorance, but willingly. And just as Isaac returned from the dead, in order for God to be considered faithful, Jesus Christ would return through a greater and better resurrection. Abraham was able to stand his test because he believed in a victory beyond the grave. Now remember one thing. This is the author pointing out that Abraham believed in the resurrection back in Genesis 22, way before any resurrection had taken place. Before Christ and before any other resurrection, Abraham believed in something that had never happened. How much more should we have hope in the resurrection? Abraham believed in something that God had never done, but we are simply called to believe that God will do it again. God was faithful to Abraham. God was faithful to Christ, and He's faithful to us. This is how the faithful one withstands God's test. And finally, our text shows that it's not only the faithful Abraham, but also his heirs, his offspring. All of them look forward to a final exodus. The faithful one looks to God's final exodus, our fifth point. The first, mention, first one mentioned is Isaac, verse 20. Isaac learned from his father's faithfulness. And he trusts that the Lord would fulfill his, all that he had promised to Abraham in the future through his offspring, Jacob and Esau. A lot of people think that faith 
is just believing about what the Bible says about the past. God created the world in the past. Jesus was born, died, and was raised in the past. But that's not just it. Faith is also believing about the future, the things concerning the future. Looking forward to the final exodus, faith looks to a future beyond the grave. The reason why we can resist temptation, the temptation of falling away, is because we can look forward to what God has stored for us beyond this world. For those of you who are married or have help with wedding preparations, you remember all the excitement of that time. You remember the feeling of that preparation, of that upcoming marriage. So much expectation. All of your efforts, all of your, of your resources, your time, your thoughts, your talk, everything centers around that upcoming day. You're looking forward to that day. You're looking forward to that union that you desire so much. It's the only thing you can think about. You have a clear goal in mind. And you will not rest until that day comes. Well, as Christians, you, we should be future-oriented as well. A far greater wedding feast is ahead of us. In a greater country. And how are we not excited about this? How are we not overflowing with joy and excitement about the coming of this day, about this wedding feast that is prepared? It is coming. It is near. A greater wedding feast, a greater country. When we keep heaven in our minds, it shapes our lives. It prepares us for the glorious occasion for the glorious union with Christ in eternity. He makes us citizens fit for heaven, as Jonathan Edwards would say. Jacob had also a future-oriented faith. Jacob was on the brink of death, but he knew that that was not the end. So he blessed Joseph's sons and worshipped the Lord in verse 21. He knew his death would not put an end to God's promises. Jacob worship, waiting for something better. And this staff imagery points to a final pilgrimage that would happen, a final exodus that would happen. And the book of Genesis finishes with a double funeral. Different than the majesty of how the book of Genesis began, the book of Genesis finishes showing that dust returns to dust. But it's still showing the grace of God in leading his people, even beyond this world. And finally, in verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he died. All these three characters were on the verge of death. He didn't talk about their lives. He could have talked about so much about how they lived, but he chose to talk about how they died, about how they were on a threshold of another world. As the famous quote says, it's not about how you live, but how you die, how you finish. The final chapter of the book of Genesis, Joseph who had lived most of his life in Egypt, requested his bones should be taken up and buried in the lane of Canaan. He knew. He knew that one day the people would depart Egypt. He knew that was not the final destination. He knew one day they would leave. But he also had the hope of the resurrection. Otherwise, it doesn't matter where his bones were. But he knew. He had the hope of departing. The hope of a final exodus. Verse 22. The word for departing here is exodus. Greater exodus than the one that happened with Moses through a better redeemer, through a better mediator, 
through Jesus Christ. Even though he would die, the hope of resurrection was there. The deliverance of the just is not merely a redemption out of exile, but a redemption out of death. Life out of death. Exodus. Going to the celestial city. Interesting how Abraham's faith was not only a blessing to him, but also to his offspring. By faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Joseph. Isaac believed, Jacob believed, Joseph believed. It's a beautiful picture of how faith in the promises ought to be transmitted to the next generations. This is not always the case. We have the mention of Esau here. It was an exception. But it's God's ordinary means of saving his covenant children. The child of a believer is not automatically a believer, but it is a biblical pattern that children often follow the example of their godly parents. Our faith in the Lord will motivate our children to have faith, to trust in Him in the same way. And hopefully this faith will impact not only our children, but it will impact those around us as well. It will be a blessing beyond the boundaries of Israel to all the nations. This man or this woman is not from around here. I want you to know more about where he comes from or where she comes from and where he's going. Do people look to us and see the evidence of citizens of heaven, of citizens of a better country, strangers in this world, longing for a better place? All these examples we saw today were near death. We are all near death as well. That's why hope beyond the grave is so important. But perhaps you don't have this hope. Perhaps you're here today, but you are still lost. You don't hope for anything beyond this world. Or perhaps you think, how could I dare to hold to these promises? How would I dare to approach this God? How could there be hope to someone like me? So let me tell you one last thing about this hope. Abraham was seeking this heavenly city, the patriarchs, the prophets, the old, all the Old Testament. And the way to the heavenly city was finally made manifest and possible through Jesus Christ. You can open with me in Revelation chapter 21, verses 2 to 7. Revelation 21, verses 2 to 7. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. It is done. It is finished. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of the life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The vision of John in Revelation 21 verse 3 
began when Christ came down from heaven and dwelt among us to tabernacle in our midst, as we read in John 1. The promise of God with us that the prophets expected for so long, that they longed for so long, was already manifested as we read He dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. John 1, 14. The vision of John in Revelation 21, verse 3, is already entering reality, already here and now, since Christ came. So even more than the patriarchs, we can already taste of the heavenly reality coming near to us, already here, but not fully yet. Not fully yet. Revelation 21 verse 3 will be a, a culmination of John 1 14. It's not the beginning of something new, but a culmination of all that started when Christ came. Of what He already obtained for us when He cried out, It is finished! He is our God and we are His people. In Christ, this Catholicity is already inaugurated here and now. We are leaving the last days before He calls us home. The altar is telling us the same thing that He told the Jews converts. Press on, press on. The city that all the prophets and apostles expected. It's here. It's so near. It's so close. Press on. In fact, through Christ, the new Jerusalem is already entering reality. The nations are being gathered. The nations are being gathered to him. People from different nations, tongues and tribes and are being gathered before the throne. He's already making all things new. Press on. May the Lord help us to live like these saints of old, to live and die in faith for His glory. They look forward to their true homeland, the heavenly city. They knew that even if they die, their final destination could not be taken away from them. They had faith beyond the grave. May the Lord help us to have the same. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord God Almighty, we come before thy throne now. After we have heard thy word, after we have heard of heavenly realities, after we have heard of the promises that go beyond this world, impress these truths in our hearts, Lord. Makes us citizens of heaven to live and die in faith, to profess like the saints of old, faith in Thee, to hold fast, to endure, And behold, the day is near. The day of the Lord is coming. So prepare us, Lord, for that day. That we will taste the culmination of all that Christ has begun. That we will taste all things new. And we will see face to face. We will behold the glory of the only begotten of the Lord, of the Father. Prepare us and help us to profess to all nations the only way to salvation, Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.